Hebrews 3, verse 17. Obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls, and they are accountable to God. Give them reason to do this with joy and not with sorrow. That would certainly not be for your benefit. Paul, along with the Christian community, faced another riotous mob two weeks ago. And they're upset at what is being said and what is being done because, well, after all, Christ has this way of affecting how your business is run because these people that were starting to riot were business owners who made idols. And they didn't like it because nobody was buying idols anymore. They were all coming to Jesus. And so they, these businessmen riled everybody up in that city. Now, Paul was not really right there immediately. He was elsewhere. So they grabbed his friends and drug them to the amphitheater and started shouting, Artemis, great as Artemis, get rid of these guys, beat them up. And Paul wanted to go check it out and say, no, no, to calm them down. Everybody that was with him said, nope, don't you go there. And they wouldn't let him go. But the mayor of the town or the, the, the secretary, whatever you want to call him, quieted the crowd down and said, you're about to get us in trouble with Rome. Are you sure you wish to keep doing that? Well, Christianity should affect the economy, and not just personally, but in the community as well. If we are doing our jobs as Christians out in the community, guess what? People are going to have a hard time with you. And you're going to have to go, natter, natter, boo-boo, tough noogies, I don't care. <laughs> when you can affect those around you to get them to understand just who Jesus Christ is, the one that you serve, you never know. They may say, well, gosh, tell me more about this fellow. And they may say, well, gosh, you're inviting me to church and I've been turning down for hours and years and months and everything. And they might just start coming with you. You never know. It's a good thing. You see, this change that these people experience will not always be a welcome thing. But God preserves his work and he protects and preserves you when you're following his will and doing what you need to do in obedience. God never abandons us at all. Never, ever. So when this all this trouble ended at this town, Paul sent for the local disciples and said, hey, I'm going to give you all this encouragement, but I really need to leave. I've got other places to be to do this all over again. And that's where we're going to pick it up when he's on his way to Macedonia in Acts 20, verses 2 through 5. When he had gone through those districts and had given them much exhortation, he came to Greece. And there he spent three months, and when a plot was formed against him by the Jews as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. And he was accompanied by Sopater of Berea, the son of Pyrrhus, and by Aristocras and Succodus of, Thessal of the Thessalonians, and Gaius of Derbe, and Timothy, and Tychus, and Trophimus of Asia. But these had gone ahead and were waiting for us at Troas. Paul spent his time working with all these other churches. Three months. He was so cool about it. I'm going to tell you everything that I think you need to know. I need to pump you up, and then I need to move back. But you see, he sat there, and when he heard that the Jews were about to get rambunctious again, he decided, I need to get out of here. Paul spent his time working with the churches he had already established, and Paul's extended time in this region may answer the question that has driven people nuts for a long time, and not me because I know it's in the Bible. And that is, it says in Romans 15, 19b, that Paul made this claim. So that from Jerusalem around Elycrium, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Well, where the heck is this? Where is this city? Because it never mentions in Acts that Paul went here. But it may fit here in Acts because of what it tells us in Romans 15, 19. And of course, that's why we always have to say the Bible is its own best commentary. If you have questions about something, I'm sure that if you looked it up elsewhere in the Bible, you'd find the answer to what you're really confused about. 
Illyria is due west from Thessalonica. Thessalonica. I got it right this time. <laughs> and there was a famous Roman road, and I'm sure that you all have heard it. And that is the Via Ignatia that went between Thessalonica and the Roman province of this city. Today, this city is in modern day Albania and on the eastern coast of the Adriatic Sea, with the mainland of Italy westward towards the water. The mention of this city in Romans 5.19 reminds us that the book of Acts does not give you everything that you need to know and understand of where all Paul went. If we did have that book, it would be like the, probably like the Britannica series of encyclopedias, and that would just be your book of Acts. There is much, and even in the life of Paul, that is not described. Just like Jesus, what about all the stuff that we know about Jesus in the New Testament and the Gospels? Does it tell everything you need to know about Jesus right there? No. Does Jesus tell you everything about himself? No, not really. But boy, he sure points to it in the Old Testament. And those are the things that we need to remember. Now Paul, he's traveling with a bunch of people right now that are probably from other churches that he's encouraged in the past and they're all headed down to where they're wanting to be uh, where they're wanting to go they were actually the present ambassadors of these other churches and for Paul's good stewardship and regard they collected everything that they had financially and that and they were traveling with Paul and they were probably having a really good time now Acts 20 verse 7 through 12 tells us on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. They were, there were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered together. And there was a young man named Eutychus sitting on the windowsill, sinking into a deep sleep. And as Paul kept on talking, he was overcome by sleep and fell down from the third floor and, and was picked up dead. But Paul went down and fell upon him, and after embracing him, he said, Do not be troubled, for his life is in him. When he had gone back up and had broken the bread and eaten, he talked with them for a long while until daybreak, and then he left. They took away the boy alive and were greatly comforted. This goes to tell you, Paul was not the most dynamic preacher in the world. He put his audiences to sleep. But that's okay. If you killed over dead from boredom, he'd bring you back to life. I really shouldn't be that, 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 that mean and crude with Paul. This is actually the first example of Christians getting together on the first day of the week and breaking bread. And this is a practice that we still do today. What is today? The first day of the week. That's why it's listed on the calendar as such. They gathered in the evening because why? Well, because Sunday was a normal working day for them. They didn't have blue laws in those days where you couldn't have your shops open. The combination of the late hour, the heat, and perhaps the fumes from the oil. Have you ever, you ever smelt an oil lamp burning? Oh, it'd give you a headache after a very short time frame. Well, between that and Paul speaking, it made this, this young feller fall asleep. And he, his fall to his death certainly would have put a sour note on that meeting. Oh my gosh, oh, we have to stop. But Paul went down and fell upon the boy. Now, what does this tell you? He's dead. He's telling the people that picked him up, put him back down, and Paul laid on him. He laid on him. And in a way, and I'm pretty sure he prayed, but he laid on him in a way that we actually have examples of this in the past. One is in, and I don't have this in there for under mention, Genesis, when God breathed into man. He laid himself out, head to toe, mouth to mouth, eye to eye, fingertip to fingertip, toe to toe, and breathe life. Mm -hmm. We also have the things in 1 Kings 17 21. Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and called on the Lord and said, Oh Lord my God, I pray you, let this child's life return to him. And the child lived. 
If you went through 2 Kings, verse 4, 32 through 35, you would find the same thing. And now this is Elijah and Elisha. They did the same things. And Paul, again, receiving the gift of faith from God, knows if I do this, this boy is going to live. His time is not come. Now, Paul, obviously, after doing this, did what any good preacher would do. He gets their attention back and preaches all day night. He finishes his message. <laughs> Acts 20, 11. When he had gone back up and had broken the bread and eaten, he talked to them a long while until daybreak, and then he left. He's energized. He's excited. And there was a lot of cool stuff that happened that night. <clears throat> and I really like this statement because it pertains to what I'm always telling everybody in this church. What I told everybody at the last church and the one before that in Juntura. If you have a question, raise your hand and I'll stop and I will answer your question and I won't miss a beat. Paul didn't miss a beat. He got up and said, well, better give me a little food. You know, that, that, that healing and that resurrection stuff really took a little bit out of me. <laughs> and then he preached the rest of the night. <laughs> I promise you I will not be here at midnight tonight still preaching. <laughs> now when this was all over Paul sent those devoted guys with him ahead of him he sent them ahead to meet them in Asos and why he decided to continue walking there I don't know I have no answer for that maybe he needed a little alone time with God just him and God don't you feel like that every now and then, that sometimes life is just so hectic and you've been sharing Jesus with everybody and, and life is just coming. Down. Don't you sometimes just think, I need a break, I need a little alone time, me and God? To go sit in the woods, to go for walks, to go for a drive, just do anything so that you're not necessarily around people. That might be what he needed to do to re-energize himself for the things coming up. Acts 20, verses 16 and 17. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in Asia. For he was hurrying to be in Jerusalem. If possible, now if possible on the day of Pentecost. From Miletus he sent, he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. Paul's intention was not to slight these guys. He spent three years with them. He'd been teaching them day after day after day he gave them encouragement before he left to go to Greece but he wanted to hurry to Jerusalem because well gosh you know I really don't want to miss the day of Pentecost for those guys that's kind of an important day it's kind of an important one for us as well so here he is though he knew he couldn't make that brief visit because anytime you go somewhere with the people you know is it, isn't it hard to get away he might miss that day, but he still wanted to pour more of his heart into these leaders, giving them the encouragement they needed. So from there, at that city, Miletus, he called for the elders of the church to come for a special meeting. This is almost like that, that get-together that we had, which was the congregational uh, get-together that where they decided all the stuff with Jesus. That first, that first conference this is almost like the first business meeting i need for you guys to come i got some stuff important stuff to tell you acts 20 verses 18 through 21 and when they had come to him he said to them you yourselves know from the first day that i set foot in asia how i was with you the whole time serving the lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which came upon me through the plots of the jews how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Most of the time in Acts, we see Paul the evangelist, don't we? He goes into the synagogues and he's an evangelist. He's trying to do the great big synagogue revivals to bring people to Jesus. But here we get this unique picture of Paul. He is Paul the pastor. 
and what is important to him as a leader uh, and a shepherd of God's people. This is the stuff that we kind of want to focus on just a little bit for the rest of the day. How important it is to be a good shepherd and pastor. Paul first calls attention to himself as an example. Now, not an example instead of Jesus, but as an example that he followed what Christ wanted him to do. Christ wanted him to go out into the world and teach and preach and bring people back to the fold. Paul didn't act like a religious celebrity, though, did he? He didn't say, well, look at me and all the great stuff I did. You remember those, those people I healed and brought back to life? Look at how great I am. He didn't say, you remember those demons? They knew who I was. They mentioned me by name. I am a great individual. Paul didn't look at it that way. Paul never put himself above Jesus. Jesus and God were always number one in his life. And in this ideal, these are the same examples that we should set towards other people. We should sit there and promote Jesus way before we come close to talking about ourselves at all. Even when they see the tribulations and trials that you face, it should be an encouragement. After all, what did Paul face? And he tells us about it in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 24 through 28. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I had spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys and dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen. Dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. Even through all of this garbage that this man has faced, pretty much on a daily basis until he died. He was still more concerned about that church than himself. But did you ever hear him complain? Not once. Not once did he ever complain. He got up and just pressed on with life. Because life brings and presents all this ugliness that you will face. And Paul did not complain so that everybody could go, oh, poor is Paul, giving into the Paul pity party. He didn't ask for that yet. His focus was on Jesus. The things that we face in life, that people know about, if we keep the smile on our face, if we keep Jesus as the focus, guess what? Those things don't mean jack. And it shows people that you are different from them. And they might actually ask why. Paul could solemnly say before these elders of the Ephesians church that he held back nothing, nothing. He gave it everything he had and it was helpful to them. He wanted to preach all the word of God to all the people. He did not just preach in public, in a public forum or just at the synagogue. He actually taught in the home of fellow, fellow followers of Christ. He was an in-house pastor. And if you remember and think about all these different towns, when he would go from house to house, it just went to show there is no physical church in those towns. Just like, where is our church? Right here. In your chest, in your hearts. We just meet here in a school building. But when we're here worshiping and praising, guess what? The Holy Spirit's here. Jesus is with us. And it's quite possible that each of the elders of the Ephesian churches <coughs> or each had a home church in their house. And Paul was built there. They were much like house churches, pastors, uh, uh, house church pastors and what we think of today as a board of elders. They held services in their own home and they taught and they prayed and they sang and they just had a wonderful time. And I'm sure that they even had the wonderful potlucks. 
Acts 20, verses 20 through 24. And now behold, bound by the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me except, uh, there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that the bonds and afflictions await me. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus, to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. Paul didn't know what was ahead of him. He knew it was not going to be pleasant. He knows from the past when, it, when Jesus first came and talked to him, when he put the scales over his eyes, Jesus said, you're going to face stuff for me that you've never experienced in your life. Even Ananias was told when he, not, when he prayed over him and the scales fell off, Ananias was told, I have plans for him that he's not going to like and appreciate. He's about to live a very hard run. But it didn't trouble him. He had a job to do, and he was willing to do it. And I really would hope that a lot of Christians would be in the same frame of mind and attitude. As a Christian, my life is not going to be easy. Things are not going to have where I'm walking down the road, people are going to throw their coats on for me to walk. I don't have to worry about people, you know, oh, right now, oh my God, heal me up. I don't have to worry about that. I know that things are going to happen to me because I'm a follower of Christ. Even though Paul did not know what things would happen to him, he never changed his plans to preach the gospel. As Christian members of, of the world, we should never change our plans because we are afraid that something bad might happen. Hey, remember, we just got through talking. God protects everybody that's doing his will. That's the important bit. Psalm 16, 8. I have set the Lord continually before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. I look at stuff in the world and say, what, you want to hurt me? Bring it on, bring it on. I got God. You may hurt me physically, but I got God and he's got me. Paul firmly believed this and he led his life in this manner and he was unafraid. We should not be afraid either. Do you live your lives the same way as Paul did or do you allow things of the world to cause you to waver? Paul recognizes the dangerous road ahead of him and he's not afraid and he's willing to lay his life down for the gospel. That's how important this is. Paul thought of himself as an accountant, carefully weighing the credits and the expenses, and in the end, he does not count his life dear to him. I don't count my life dear to me, which is why I don't mind getting up and topping them trees out. Compared to his God and how he can serve him. Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Paul thought of himself as a runner who had to finish that great race, and nothing would keep Paul from finishing the race with joy. Notice Paul speaks about his race that he has to run. We have our own. Our own race that we're, that we're running is not the same as Paul's. We don't have necessarily the same overall task that Paul had, which was to take the gospel into an entire world that doesn't know God. We have to live our lives and bring it to what we have locally. Otherwise, I'd be seeing you all set sail for over uh, to Africa, to other countries, and never see you again, maybe. 
until we met in heaven. Even at this point in time, Paul has his own death in mind. I am not done till God says I'm done. He's going to run that race and with joy. Now, it would be really a whole lot of years before he actually dies and gets killed. But he knows that what he's doing is worth dying for. That in the words of Charles Spurgeon, he preached the gospel worth dying for. Is it a worthy challenge to any preacher? Is the gospel you preach worth dying for? I have to say absolutely it is. Acts 20, verse 25. And behold, now remember, he's still talking to the Ephesian group that he called over. And now behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will no longer see my face. He's telling them, you're not going to see me again. I have, this, is how I have, this is why I'm telling you all this stuff. <clears throat> and this had to have been really a, a, a really big surprise to them. They've seen the miracles that God performed through him. He, they saw the demons that were exercised. They saw how, how used and abused he was by most of the people in that city. But he's still so focused on this life-transforming gospel for the kingdom of God that he's telling them, I have more work to do and I'm going to go about doing it and I probably am not coming back. You won't see me again till we're all together with God and with Christ. To them, this would have been something of great sadness. What? Our, our, our mentor, our, our teacher, what, what do you mean? What, you, you, we won't see you again. This is how the disciples probably felt when Jesus told them, I have a job. I have a mission that I'm on. And when the time comes, you will not see me again until I return. What? What do you mean? You can't go away. We won't allow it to happen. <laughs> but this would be like a bombshell, even as it was the disciples. They're, they probably made them stop and, and look, well, what are we supposed to do now if we don't have you anymore? But don't forget the bond that Paul had with these guys. He's been with these guys for a long time and teaching a ministry that was so effective that Acts 19 says, all who dwelt in Asia heard the word, heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. That's how effective he was. Everybody heard. The amount of time and that kind of effective ministry builds bonds and fellowship. I have a bond and fellowship with the majority of you. When the last church asked for the resignation, who was the people that said, this ain't right, and went with me? The non-members. The non-members came with me. I have a bond. I had a bond with you. And that's what's so wonderful. It was hard for them to believe it. Maybe at first they thought he was just joking. Well, we all know they weren't joking at, at the other church. But that's okay. But they quickly understood that he wasn't, and, they, and that's why he sent for them to walk the 36 miles to come see him. Because he was not going to divert to for them. In all this, Paul's great love and concern for the leaders and congregation in Ephesus was simply a reflection of Jesus his great love and concern for them. Paul followed Jesus in every way he could since Jesus loved these believers so much, so did Paul. Acts 20, verses 26 and 27. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. <clears throat> Think about that word for just a moment, that word therefore. D-O-T, meaning this account, on this account that, because for. I probably won't see you again because I love you so much, because I've invested so much of my heart and life among you. You therefore need to know 
that. I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. Think about that one for just a minute. It's as if he were giving witness in a court of law. I testify for you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. Paul declared that his heart was clean and clear. He had done everything that he could to leave these Christians to God's care with a good conscience knowing that he had not shunned or misled them in anything. He gave them the whole counsel of God. Ezekiel 3.19 Yet if you, had warned, if you have warned the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered yourself. Paul feels, I gave everything I could. I testified the gospel, and if no one wants to believe it, I've done my part. I'm good. And we should have a great appreciation of that value of a clear conscience. God helping us. We can have one at least as clear as possible from this point forward. If you do everything possible to get people to turn from sinning and lead them in the right direction, you have done everything you can. And you know what? You can sleep well tonight. You do not have to worry about anybody else. Paul could leave them with that clear conscience because he knew that he taught them the whole purpose of God. Remember, he spent two years. Or was that three? I think it was three. three. No, nope, more than two years. Using a rented room at Tyrannius, and he taught the people, and I'm pretty sure he taught them every day everything in the Old Testament. And then he put the gospel on top of it. These people were prepared. He could sleep well at night. Hundreds of hours of teaching time. Wouldn't you have loved to have sat in that room for that two plus years? Heck, you'd be up here doing all this. He had plenty of time to do the verse by verse stuff. He could walk through all those scriptures verse by verse and explain to them exactly what happened. Remember, he's a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was a learned man. They may have also studied the life of Jesus from some of the accounts of his life being written in that same period. Today, there should be more and more who present the whole purpose of God. Paul warned that preachers would do this particular thing in 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires, and will turn away their ears from the truth, and will turn aside to myths. Many preachers today simply use this Bible text as a launching pad, and then go on to say what they want. You remember what I was asked to do at the last church? We do not like what you're preaching. We want to hear the gospel. That's all we want to hear. We don't want to hear all the stuff that tells about Jesus. We don't want to dear, learn about the Old Testament. It's nothing to us. We do not live in the Old Testament. We want the gospel. Tickle our ears. Make us, give us what we want. Think about how some uh, pastors do. They, they throw out Bible quotations to illustrate their points or to illustrate their stories. But what happens when they do that? They take it out of context. They take the scripture out of context just so that they can make it look really good and, and more pleasing. Yet the real calling of a preacher is to simply let the Bible speak for itself. Let the Bible talk for itself. Let it declare its own power. The Bible is his own best commentary. Taking Paul's testimony at full strength, we must say that those preachers who deliberately fail to declare the whole purpose of God are guilty of the blood of all men. They are misleading. The preacher who preaches what his audience wants to hear and not the whole purpose of God hurts both his audience and himself. Do I tickle your ears? 
I don't think so. Sometimes I put you to sleep. I admit that. <laughs> but I don't see you falling down and breaking your necks and dying where I have to throw my bodies on top of you. <laughs> but I don't tickle your ears. I give you the Word of God. And I preach the Word of God. I don't say anything other than the Word of God. And if it's an opinion, I say, this is my opinion. This is my opinion of what I read. It may not be what you think, and that's fine. We all have opinions. Acts 20, 28. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Remember, he's still talking to these people, the leadership of the Ephesian people, the Ephesian churches. This is the leadership. Pay attention to your own life. You have a high standard to fulfill. The standard isn't perfection, but it is never less high. You won't fulfill that high standard without paying attention to it if you don't take heed to yourselves. The words from Paul were all the more dramatic knowing that the tension and atmosphere of this meeting, he knew that what he was telling them was something so serious that they need to really pay attention. These words mattered. 1 Timothy 5.21, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of his chosen angels to maintain these principles without bias, doing nothing in a spirit of partiality. The godly leader knows that effective leadership flows from a life, not just knowledge. If I am not living in, in, in my life in Christ-like manner, is my knowledge worth a plug nickel? No, because I'm, I'm showing you one thing and doing another. He tells them to pay attention to the people of God. Love them. Look over them. Care for them. Do it because the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Now, overseers, epikopos, a man charged with the duty of seeing th that things to be done by others are done rightly, a superintendent, elder, or overseer of a Christian church. They are responsible for shepherding the church of God. I am a shepherd. If I let you fall through the cracks, am I doing my job? No. They are responsible for shepherding the church of God. And he is telling them to be pastors, to shepherd the church of God, to serve their house church congregation as faithful pastors. Shepherds don't only feed, they also lead. Remember what Jesus told Peter, 1 Peter 5, no, I'm sorry, that's, that's in the bulletin. That's what when Jesus was talking to Peter. 1 Peter 5, verses 2 and 3, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but providing to be examples to the flock. I'm sure that if you ask some of my people that work for me, they will, they will tell you, no, nope, no, nope, no, nope, he's not living that right life. I see Kelly grinning. <laughs> but it's okay. It's okay. It's all good. Kelly knows that I really do my best to live the right, my example. Under the guidance of Christ the shepherd and in the community of God's people, they lead the people of God where God wants them to be. This is one important reason why they, take, they need to take heed of themselves and to the flock of God. Ephesians 5.26b Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. They had, to, they had to do it because the church doesn't belong to them. You don't belong to me. You belong to Jesus. But I'm here to shepherd you to make sure that everything is doing, that you're doing it right. Because Jesus purchased you with his blood. I didn't purchase you. <clears throat> Any responsible person is going to take greater care of something if it's entrusted to them as if it was their own. You guys are entrusted to me. 
and I'm not going to do anything that harms that. I'm not going to break you. I'm not going to have Jesus go, why did you do that, and have to answer for it. Leaders of a church sometimes forget this basic principle, though, and want to do things their way, resulting in things falling apart. Did I cause this to fall apart at the last church? I don't think so. I think they did not want anything but ear tickling. They wanted it, in Frank Sinatra's opinion, my way. <laughs> we want it our way. And I wouldn't give it. Because it goes against everything God wanted me to do. And I knew it. And you know what's really bad? Leaders need to remember that the church belongs to Jesus. But what's really bad is that what he's telling them as they're there in Acts 20:29. 20, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Paul presses urgency here, warning these leaders that savage wolves will come in amongst them all. And he knew that a pastor, a leader among God's people, has to do more than just feed and lead. He also has to protect. Paul doesn't say how he knew, only that he did know. Galatians 5.15 but if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. It may, it may have been the examples he has experienced from all the uh, other Pharisees and other synagogues and other people that are Jewish and from possibly other worldly people from the towns and how they treated the new Christians. But these wolves would be a little different. These would be vicious. They wouldn't hold back against the people of God but take as many of them as they could down with them. Acts 20, 30. And from among your own selves men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. It's often easier for pastors to deal with the wolves that come from the outside. I can see those things coming from the outside, but it's the internal within the church. Those are the hardest ones to see. Those are the ones that take you really by surprise most of the time. But what are we watching for? What are we supposed to be watching for? False teachings and goofy kinds of doctrine. And boy, did I hear some in the past. It made those hardcore things. Don't you ever say that stuff out loud. Don't you ever do it. But it's really hard to deal with that internal stuff because it's the internal that breaks the church body apart. 1 Timothy 4.1 But the Spirit explicitly says that the later times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and the doctrines of demons. Imagine how these men listening to Paul would have received this one. It was bad enough that he said, this is the last time you're going to see me. And now he's telling them all this stuff. It would not be hard for them to leave, just like the disciples with Jesus. Oh, one of you is going to betray. Oh, not me, Lord, not me, Lord. These guys have got to be doing the same thing. Oh, who is it? Is it me, Pete, or Paul? Is it me? They have to be ready to identify and squash the words of the gospel being twisted, which would lead people to follow the bad things. This is their motivation. They wanted a fellowship. The ego can make some people do things that they never thought that they would do. You could sit there and have a pastor that will be, and I like using mega churches, but I won't name names, that will tell you things, take away your money, and tell you, oh, it's done for all this good. But what do they do? They allow it to do things for their own earthly benefits. Planes, vehicles, jewelry. But I need all this to be able to spread the word of God quicker. I need to show this so that it shows that God is so powerful that, see, it makes us all rich. I don't know. I really don't. Acts 20, verse 31. Therefore be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. There is that word, therefore, again. 
Paul asked them to have the same careful concern for the people of God that he himself had. If you can follow my example, you're following Jesus' example. And guess what? The people are going to be the better for it. Acts 20, verses 32 through 35. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or clothes. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my own needs and to the men who were with me. In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, that he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Though Paul gave his all for the Christians in Ephesus for some three years at the bottom line, he could only commend them to God. He could only give them and show him his grace to show that God is, is there for them. Paul knew that there was trouble ahead of him and that some trouble ahead for these guys as well. You're going to face these things. Just stand up, be strong, be courageous, trust in God. Yet God, is the God and the word of his grace, it's going to see you through. 2 Corinthians 12, 9b. My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. <clears throat> Even in large healthy churches, just chock full of people, can do things that make them feel good. Still a work-based thing, when you think about it, while misleading them, giving them a false security. I like to think of a program that we had at one church I attended over in Cheney. And it was called the CARE program. You had telephone care, letter care. You had it just, it was just everything that once a week you had a, a bunch of people in the church that would get together and you were broken up in a little group. So if I was part of the telephone care committee, I would call a handful of people in the church and say, hey, we're thinking about you. Or if I was on the, the, the card committee, I would write, send them a card. Hey, we're thinking about you. And all those things were nothing but feel-good things. They were, it was a program. Did that really do anything? It may have made somebody feel really important for a, a few moments. Oh, look, they were nice enough to remember to send me a card. Or I got this wonderful phone call. But that was it. Programs cannot do it. The spirit of this age cannot do it. Slick marketing can't do it. Entertainment can't do it. Only God and the word of his grace can build you up and give you an inheritance in the kingdom of heaven. That's it. I can, I can help lift you up, but I cannot provide you with a thing that you're, that you're going to get to heaven on your own. Paul concludes by trying to communicate his heart, his motive in the ministry. He wasn't in it for himself, but for, the, for, but for God's glory, for crying out loud, and for the buildup of God's people. Leaders must be more concerned about what they can give their flock than concerned about what their flock can give them. Without a heart of sacrifice, there can be no real effect of eternal ministry. And it should be a glad sacrifice, knowing the blessedness of it all. Acts 20, verses 36 through 38. When he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And they began to weep aloud and embrace Paul and repeatedly kissed him, grieving especially over the word which he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they were accompanying him to the ship. Paul was not a cold, robotic, monotone kind of speaker. Well, that might be why the guy fell asleep. <laughs> But he didn't teach the gospel that way. I'm sure Paul got as excited as I do sometimes, or you do sometimes. He's not that robotic kind of person, but a warm-hearted, pastoral man who loved his people greatly, believing they would only meet again in eternity. They part with prayer, tears, and a sending off party, believing that they would only meet again in heaven. <clears throat> Given the strength of Paul's warning to these leaders, it is fair to wonder how the Christian community in Ephesus fared after this. Don't you, don't you remember reading about this a little bit? These guys are strong. They were uplifted by Paul. He did not use the uh, 
what do we call a program the spirit of the age he did not use a slick marketing trick he talked to them one-on-one -on -one. he uplifted them gave them courage gave them strength but yet 30 to 40 years later Jesus sent a letter to his church in Ephesus and we find that letter in Revelation 2 he complimented them on many things didn't he their hard work for the kingdom of God, their endurance through the difficult times, dealing with those who are evil and with false apostles, and not giving up when they were weary. However, Revelation 2, 4, but I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Despite all this, Jesus gave them this severe warning, unless things changed in a hurry, Jesus wouldn't even be present among them anymore. In their zeal to fight against the false doctrines, which they seemed to do well, they left their love for Jesus and their love for one another. They abandoned each other. Matthew 26, verses 36 through 40. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to them, to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depends the whole law and the prophets. David Guzik put it this way. It's a great illustration of the principle that the devil doesn't care which side of the boat we fall out of just as long as we're in the water and not in the boat. Pastor Danny told me what seems like a long, long time ago, and I mean long time ago. Wherever you go to pastor, love the people. This is what congregations want and need so badly. A strong, healthy church of a few will not grow if the people don't feel loved or cared about. If you, if you don't know, I do, I sincerely, deeply love you all and want to bring God's whole purpose to you through his word. Let's go to prayer.